you could chew for yourself. All right, chapter 12. I must have a bow, Matt decided one morning. He was envious of the bow a Tian often carried behind his shoulder and of the blunt arrows he tucked into his belt. Only the day before, Matt had watched him swing it suddenly into position and bring down a flying duck. A Tian had picked up the dead bird carefully and carried it away with him. No doubt the Indians would find some use for every scrap and bone and feather. Matt knew by now that a Tian never shot anything just for the fun of it. With a bow and a little practice, Matt thought now he might get a duck for himself. It would be fine, a fine change from his usual fish. So we have learned a little bit about Native Americans and how they respected animals and nature very much. And so they would find use for every part of the animal. They would, they would literally find something for everything. They would, they would find a way to use every bone, every sinew, every muscle, every every part of the animals. They did not throw things away. Miranda? It's like in the uh, Indiana Weekly. About the yes, buffalo. about the buffalo. Yes, it's exactly like Indiana Weekly where the, it's a treasured animal or it's the animals are very much respected. And so they make sure to use every part of it. Good. Um, he had no doubt he could shoot with a bow. In fact, he had made them years ago back in Quincy. He and his friend had played at Indians, stalking each other through the woods and whooping out from behind trees. They had even half practiced, practiced half earnestly at shooting at a target. How could he have known that someday he would really have need of such a skill? He cut a straight branch, notched it at either end, and stretched tight a bit of string his father had left. Arrows he whittled out of slender twigs. But something was definitely wrong. His arrows wobbled off in odd directions or flopped on the ground a few feet away. He was chagrined when next morning a Tian came walking out of the woods and surprised him at his practice. A Tian looked at the bow. Not good wood, he said at once. I get better. He was very exacting about the wood he chose. He searched along the edge of the clearing, testing saplings, bending slender branches, discarding one after another until he found a dead branch of ash about the thickness of his three fingers. He cut a rod almost his own height and handed it to Matt. Take off bark, he directed and squatted down to watch while Matt scraped the branch clean. Then, taking it in his hands again, he marked off several inches in the center where Matt's hand would grip the bow. Cut off wood here, he said, running his hand from the center to the ends. Make small like this, he held up one slim finger. Matt set to work too hastily. Slow, Etienne warned him. Knife take off wood too fast. Indian used stone. Under the Indian's critical eye, Matt shaved down the branch, paring off the thinnest possible shavings. The slow work took all his patience. Twice he considered the task finished, but a Tian, running his hand along the curve of the bow, was not satisfied till it was smooth as an animal bone. Need fat now, he said. Bear fat best. Will this do? Matt asked, bringing out a bowl of fish stew he had left cooling on the table. Carefully, with a bit of bark, a Tian skimmed off the drops of oil that had risen to the surface. He rubbed the oil from one end of the bow to the other till the bare wood glistened. Matt's frayed bit of string he cast aside. Instead, he set about making a bowstring as he had made the snare of long strands of spruce root. This took most of the morning as he patiently twisted the strands together, rolling them against his thigh to make them even and smooth. Finally, he tied one end to a notch in the bow and began slowly to bend the wood. The bow seemed to Matt to be as stiff as iron. It seemed impossible that it would bend, but slowly it yielded till the string slipped over the notch at the other end. The bow was finished. It's a beauty, Matt told him, filled with admiration at their joint handiwork. Atian gave a grunt of satisfaction. Shoot pretty good, he said. One day make better. Ian Indian take long time, leave wood many days till ready. Before he left, Atian cut off four slender shoots of birch wood. Best for arrow, he explained, marking off with his hands a length of about two feet. He left Matt to do the whittling for himself. Matt was delighted with the bow, but shooting it was another matter. It was not in the least like the flimsy thing he had first created. It took all of his strength to draw back the string. When he released his arrow, it flew with astonishing power off somewhere into the underbrush, anywhere but where he had aimed it. As fast as he could make new arrows, he lost them, but he was determined. He pegged a target of birch bark against a tree and shot at it grimly, his arrows coming closer and closer with every day's practice. The heel of his hand was blistered from the stinging snap of the string. Atian did not offer him any further advice, but when the root string began to fray, he brought with him one day a fine bowstring of twisted animal sinew, which would last for a long time. 
Using the new string, Matt could frequently nick the edge of his target. Soon, he promised himself the squirrels would have more respect than to frisk about so boldly over his head. Do you guys know what animal sinew is or sinew is in general? What's sinew? Gabe? Maybe muscles or skin? Uh, you're close. You're very, very close. Um, Kellen? Uh, sort of. They're, they're not quite, yes. Like the, like, skin, parts of the organ? Like, yes. Like, yes. So, it's your muscles. So, your sinews are part of your muscles, and they, they help your muscles bend. They help your muscles kind of bend in different areas. And so, you have sinews inside of yourself. Sinews are very stretchy. So, like, your elbow can bend this way because you have sinew inside of it. And so, that helps you bend. Why would sinew be good for a bowstring? Animal sinew. Why would that work for a bowstring, David? Oh, uh, I mean, like it's stretchy. Well, like, okay, say a guitar, like, it's kind of like that. Sort of. So yeah, it'll probably work with the bow and arrow. Yeah, it needs to be able to vibrate like a guitar string because it has to be pulled back, let go, and then bend a little bit. Yeah, but it has to be ridiculously strong as well. And sinews are very strong. It's hard to damage sinews in your body. Okay, sorry guys, we gotta keep going. Here we go. Chapter 13. Wherever he went now, Matt watched for Indian signs. Sometimes he could not be sure whether a branch had broken in the wind or whether an animal had scratched a queer-shaped mark on the tree trunk. Once or twice he was certain he had discovered the sign of the beaver. It was a game he played with himself. That, was, it, that it was not a game to eat a tea and he was still to learn. They were following a narrow trail one morning, this time to the east, when a tea and halted abruptly. Psst, he warned. Off in the brush, Matt heard a low, rasping breathing and a frantic scratching in the leaves. The noise stopped the moment the, they stood still. Moving warily, the boys came upon a fox crouched low on the ground. It did not run, but lay snarling at them. And as he came nearer, Matt saw that its foreleg was caught fast. With a long stick, Atian pushed aside the leaves, and Matt caught the glint of metal. White man's trap, said Atian. How do you know? Matt demanded. Indians not use iron trap. Iron trap, bad. You mean a white man set this trap? Matt thought of Ben. No, some white man paid for bad Indian to hunt for him. White men not know how to hide traps so good. Atian showed Matt how cleverly the trap had been hidden. The leaves and earth mounded up like an animal burrow with two half-eaten fish heads concealed inside. The fox watched them, its teeth bared. The angry eyes made Matt uncomfortable. We're in luck to find it first, he said to cover his uneasiness. Atian shook his head. Not beaver hunting ground, he said. Turtle clan hunt here. He pointed to a nearby tree. On the bark, Matt could just make out a crude scar that had a shape somewhat like a turtle. He was indignant. We found it, he said. You mean you're just going to leave it here because of a mark on a tree? Beaver people not take animal on turtle land, Etienne repeated. We can't just let it suffer, Matt protested. Suppose no one comes here for days. Then Fox get away. How can he get away? Bite off foot. Indeed, <laughs> Matt could see now that the creature had already gnawed its own flesh down to the bone. Leg men soon, Etienne added, noting Matt's troubled face. Fox have three legs beside. I don't like it, Matt insisted. He wondered why he minded so much. He had long ago got used to clubbing the small animals caught in his own snares. There was something about this fox, though, that was different. Those defiant eyes showed no trace of fear. He was struck by the bravery that could inflict such pain on itself to gain freedom. Reluctantly, he followed a tian back to the trail, leaving the miserable animal behind. It's a cruel way to trap an animal, he muttered. Worse than our snares. Eh, hey, Etienne agreed. My grandfather not allow beaver people to buy iron trap. Some Indian hunt like white man now. One time many moose and beaver. Plenty for all Indians and for white man too. But white man not hunt to eat, eat only for skin. Him pay Indian to get skin. So Indian use white man's trap. What other animal did we just study that the white man hunted almost nearly to extinction? Avery? The buffalo. So he says... White man only for skin. He doesn't hunt to eat. He he only gets the skin. He only wants the skin. Kellen, you have been up and down. Could you please park it at your seat? You've been up and down this entire time, bud. Um, let's see. Matt could not find an answer. 
trapping beside a tea and he was confused and angry as well. He couldn't understand the Indian code that left an animal to suffer just because of a mark on a tree. And he was fed up with Atian's scorn for white men. It was ridiculous to think that he and Atian could ever really be friends. Sometimes he wished he could never see Atian again. Even at that same moment, he realized that this was really not true. Even though Atian annoyed him, Matt was constantly goaded to keep trying to win this strange boy's respect. He would lie awake in the night, staring up at the chinks of starlight in the cabin roof and make up stories in which he himself, not Atian, was the hero. Sometimes he imagined how Atian would be in some terrible danger, and he, Matt, would be brave and calm and come swiftly to the rescue. He would kill a bear unaided, or a panther, or fend off a rattlesnake about to strike. Or he would learn about an enemy band of Indians sneaking through the forest to attack the place where Atian was sleeping, and he would run through the woods and give the alarm in time. In the morning, he laughed at himself for this childish daydreaming. There was little chance he would ever be a hero, and little chance, too, that Atian would ever need his help. Matt knew that the Indian boy came day after day only because his grandfather sent him. For some reason, the old man had taken pity on this helpless white boy, and at the same time, he had shrewdly grasped at the chance for his grandson to learn to read. If he suspected that Etienne had become the teacher instead, he would doubtless put a stop to the visits altogether. Matt knew he ought to feel grateful for Etienne's teaching. Every day, Etienne taught him some new thing, a plant like an onion that he could drop into his cooking pot to make his stew more tasty. A weed with a small orange flower and a milky juice in its stem that took away the sting of insect bites or poison ivy. A plant with brownish flowers and roots bearing a string of nut-like bulbs that thickened his stew and made it more nourishing. He had pointed out plants that Matt must never eat, no matter how hungry he might be. He had even shown Matt how to improvise a rain cape in a sudden rain by quickly punching a hole through the center of a wide strip of birch bark and making a cone of bark for his head. The only thing that Matt could teach him, Atian, was set against learning. For Atian, the white man's signs on paper were piswat, good for nothing. Nevertheless, Matt noticed that in spite of himself, Atian had learned something from the white boy. He was speaking the English tongue with greater ease. Perhaps he was not aware of himself how differently he spoke. He picked up new words readily. Sometimes he used them with that odd humor that Matt was beginning to recognize. Matt knew that Atian was mocking when some of his own favorite expressions came out solemnly out of the Indian's mouth. Reckon so, Etienne would say. Rain comes soon, by golly. Sometimes he even took a fancy to a word out of Robinson Crusoe. He especially liked the sound of verily. In return, Matt liked to try out Indian words. They were not hard to understand, but impossible to get his tongue around. He didn't think he could ever quite get them right, but he could see that though it amused Etienne when he tried, it also pleased him. Chakwa, this morning, Matt might say. I chased a cagua out of the corn patch. Do you guys remember what a cagua is? What's a cagua? Hana? Porcupine? Yes, a porcupine. Remember the dog had the cagua uh, quills in his nose? Yes, very good. He wouldn't add that he had wasted an arrow and watched the porcupine waddle off unharmed. Perhaps, after all, those lessons hadn't entirely been wasted. Awesome. So now we have a little more information about Matt and Matian.